Okay. So this is a weird book. It starts at chapter 16. That's because some of you uh, have books where it has all of it together in one big, I don't know if you've seen that, but they put all the financial chapters, the first 15 chapters, and then 16 through whatever it is for the managerial chapters all in one big book. Um, I have it as two books personally. Um, so this is kind of the intro. Remember the first stuff we did was just a review of concepts from Accounting One. Um, so uh, what I like about this book is it does lay everything out nicely in learning objectives. However, you're smart people, so I won't read those learning objectives to you. Um, you can read through those on your own. And why is there what? A pot? Because uh, it was made in Colorado. All right. I don't know why there's a pot. I'm hilarious. Yeah. All right. So the first part is kind of definitional stuff, the difference between financial and managerial accounting. Uh, I think I mentioned this the very first day. Financial, what you learned in Accounting 1, is all about the statements used by people external to the business, investors, creditors, those sorts of people. Managerial accounting is all about what the managers and owners of a company use to make decisions. Okay, So it's, it's planning, budgeting, controlling, um, and then cost-benefit analysis. That's what we're doing in, in managerial accounting. That's what we'll start learning starting today uh, going forward. So this is straight out of the book. Um, again, it's kind of a thing. That I don't know if I want to read the whole thing to you. but um, So the primary users of financial accounting are external. And the primary users of managerial accounting are internal. Okay, That makes some sense. Uh, rules and restrictions. When you do financial accounting, you have to follow generally accepted accounting principles because other people are going to see it. If you're putting something out there for investors to see and they're going to make decisions about whether or not to invest in your business, then it has to follow some standard set of rules. Uh, in Great Britain, I believe they use something called IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, as opposed to GAAP. Uh, what we're finding is those two, GAAP that we use in the United States, IFRS in the whole rest of the world, um, except for some places that use completely different accounting systems, are kind of converging. They're pretty similar now, but there's certain rules. Uh, for example, you can't use last in, first out um, inventory management in IFRS, but you can in GAAP. Okay, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but So they're pretty similar in a lot of other ways. Um, mostly what we need to know is that with the financial, we were concerned with producing those statements as accurately as possible so people outside the business could use it to make decisions about our business. And with managerial, we're using it to produce numbers that help us in decision making on how to improve and strengthen the business. So there's no real rules to managerial accounting. I mean, if you do it badly, then you could hurt your business. But because it's only for your own internal use, you can kind of make up whatever stats or reports you think are meaningful for you to make decisions. Anybody watch like SportsCenter? Have you ever seen any of the ridiculous stats they come up with? Like number of times they've won against this team when playing on a Tuesday, or I mean, they just come up with all sorts of wacky stuff. Well, because as many statisticians and people who like numbers as there are in the world, there are different systems for trying to understand numbers. Um, last night they, uh, on the game, uh, they had a winningest quarterback coach tandems as a stat. So they had uh, Belichick and uh, Brady. And they've won, like, the second is like 102, and they've won like 206 games together. So uh, I thought that was interesting, but completely useless at the same time. All right. So that's managerial accounting. Interesting, but complete. No. It's actually quite valuable. <laughs> In fact, most of my students who've left here and decided they wanted to go into accounting are now working in the managerial accounting field. If you work for Freeport MacMoran, there's only a handful of people that do the financial side that are producing the external statements. Most of the people are cost analysis people, right? Saying at this mine, how do we reduce costs and how do we uh, improve productivity? Okay. Um, we have to recognize that, well, you can read that. There's nothing exciting on there. All right. If you want to read it, go back and watch a video. There's nothing there that's going to like help you or hurt you. Um, Today's business environment, there's a, a bigger and bigger shift toward a service economy. We're not doing as much manufacturing in the United States as we used to. A lot of people feel like that's a shame. Um, I don't know that it's a shame. It's the way things have gone. 
Um, it does make us more dependent, certainly, on foreign countries for imports, right? Um, but we still do a fair amount of manufacturing here in the United States as well. Um, there's an increase in global competition. I think everybody recognizes that. Uh, that's why we're doing less manufacturing, because what does a union auto worker make in the United States? Anybody have an idea? Someone who sits on the line and puts widget A into slot B, 32 bucks an hour. Um, so when you compare that against, say, labor in Vietnam or Mexico or anywhere across Southeast Asia, it becomes harder and harder for us to compete. Um, and so a lot of stuff gets outsourced, right? Uh, and then uh, so much of the competition in today's market is, is based on how well we manage time and how well we manage our productivity within that time. Um, in other words, things like just-in-time management, uh, where we don't have inventory sitting there that we paid for six months ago so that we can use it in our product today, but instead we have the supplier deliver it today so that we can put it into our manufacturing process today so that the, out, the product comes out at the end of the day. Um, because money sitting in inventory is money that can't be used in other places. Um, and on other concepts, but, but that's more and more today what we're trying to do is be more efficient. And that's where managerial accounting comes in a lot, is trying to improve efficiency. All right, total quality management. This is just more of the stuff that's happening today. Um, that's enough. Let's get into some accounting stuff here. Um, accountants should be ethical. All right. Again, <laughs> well, I could read the whole page to you. If your mama didn't raise you right, I'm not going to fix you with, with, with reading that whole page to you, OK? Um, all right, so let's get into some of the more actual concepts. So I think we know what a service company and a merchandising company is the difference. Uh, service companies sell a service, right? A doctor's office is a service-based business. They're selling a service to people. A merchandising company sells stuff to people, um, and usually in a retail setting, but some wholesalers, you would call them merchandisers too. They buy stuff from the manufacturer, they help get it to the market, and then they mark it up a little bit and they sell it. That's how they make money. Walmart's probably the most recognizable merchandiser, or maybe Amazon's becoming the most recognizable merchandiser to a lot of us. Um, did you guys hear what, what, what Amazon sales were during the Christmas season? A billion dollars. They did 200 million in the previous year, so that's fairly good improvement then, right? To do five times what they did before. I buy everything on Amazon. It's a triple win. I get the excitement of like searching for it, that's fun. Then when it comes to my house, I get to open the present, in essence, and be like, ooh. Then I wrap it and watch my kids open it. It's like a triple win. All right. Um, but a lot of what we're going to do in this class deals with manufacturing companies. Manufacturers, wait for it, manufacture stuff. They create stuff. They take raw materials, put labor into them, and come out with a finished product. OK? You can manufacture just about. Well, anything. Um, very few things are actually raw materials, right, that we just sell to everybody. Uh, even like a mining company has to go through some sort of process, right? They, you know, Freeport McMoran, they don't just like dig a chunk of copper out of the ground and like sell it at the market. Instead, they dig out ore, they put acid through that ore, which makes a, a a slurry, sort of a, 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 a liquid that has cotton ion or cotton molecules in it, yeah. And then they, and then they put a, a a plate down in there and they charge it electrically, well, negative charge through it, so that the positive copper ions stick to it. And then they pull that out and they scrape it off. Uh, you know, there's a process they go through. So even a even a mining company, which you might think of as just dealing in a raw material, they still have to start with something even rawer than the raw material and transform it into a finished product that they're selling. Then their finished product ends up being raw material in a lot of other things, right? Copper, raw material, yes. Um, copper gets drawn into wires uh, and used in electrical components and, and used in, in many other ways. Um, I was hoping they would rake really loudly right out our window as we were doing this. So <laughs> wishes can come true, all right? All right. So that's everything I just said. 
Here's what makes it different. Here's where it starts to get different or new from what you've known before. In the past, we just had inventory. Now we have three different types of inventory. This is the, this is the big change, okay? So we don't just have inventory. We have raw materials inventory. We have work in process inventory, and we have finished goods inventory. I want you to think of it, uh, it probably doesn't happen as much now as the way it used to, but in the old days, if I were building, let's say I worked for a manufacturer and it were my job to assemble a product from raw materials, okay? Um, I don't know, let's say we made birdhouses. I would probably have a material sheet that listed all the materials needed to make one birdhouse, okay? It would probably be uh, a certain amount of wood, some nails, some wood glue, some paint. Maybe that'd be it. So what I would do is I would say, my quota today is to make 30 birdhouses. So I'd go over to the raw materials desk, for like a raw materials warehouse, and I'd say, here's what I need. I need this many pieces of wood, I need this many nails, this much wood glue, and so forth, this much paint. They would give me all that, and then they would sign a little form that showed the amount of stuff that was checked out to me, and I would sign it off. I would take those materials back over to my workspace and I would begin to cut it and assemble it and make the birdhouses. Okay? At lunchtime, I would go to lunch and there'd be some birdhouses complete and sitting there, others in process. That would be my work in process. Okay? Let's say none of them. Let's say I, I assembled them all and then I painted them all at the end. So when I went to lunch that day, all of that would be sitting there as work in process inventory. Does that make sense? Then, at the end of the day, I would come back and paint them and let them dry, and then I would take them over to the finished goods warehouse and submit them to them, and they would sign off a little sheet saying, Mike Fox turned in 30 completed birdhouses today. And that sheet would probably be used in me getting paid and things like that. So, not all inventory flows like this, but it helps me to think of a physical flow of inventory, from raw materials to work in process to a finished good. Okay. Is that you? Stand by, please. Okay. All right. Physical flow, raw materials, work in process, finished goods. All right. This may be hard for you to see from there. It's in your book, so you can check it out, but it's actually pretty valuable. So this is how the, the income statement and balance sheets differ for the three different types of businesses. Can anybody actually see it? You can even from there? Okay. So I'll explain. Let me explain to you. So service companies don't have a cost of goods sold, right, because they're selling a service. Merchandising companies have a cost of goods sold, and everything else is normal like you've seen. And a manufacturing company's income statement looks exactly like a merchandiser's. Where it differs is on the balance sheet, where instead of just invent merchandise inventory, it now has three different inventories, raw materials inventory, work in process inventory, finished goods inventory. That's it. So with a manufacturer, we have three different types of inventory. That's the big difference, okay? I'm telling you right now because as we get into it, a lot of the things we do in managerial accounting hinge on these three different types of inventory and how costs flow from one inventory account to the next inventory account. All right. So when we're trying to figure out in a merchandising, I'm sorry, in a manufacturing company how to uh, classify our costs, uh, we have two broad categories, okay? The first is called direct costs, and the second is called indirect costs. Direct costs are costs that we can trace directly to a cost object, and a cost object means a product, really, okay? So, uh, any cost for my birdhouses that I can say, I know exactly how much wood I put into one birdhouse. I can trace the cost of the wood. Okay? I know exactly how much time I spent on each birdhouse. 
I can trace the cost of my time. Those are direct costs. In fact, the two types of direct costs are direct materials and direct labor. The materials that went directly into producing that product and the labor that went directly into producing that product. Makes sense, right? The other type of cost is what's called an indirect cost, and it's not traceable to any specific cost object. And we track that in an account called manufacturing overhead. Let me give you an example. If uh, on the work floor where I produce and make my birdhouses, 30 other guys do the same thing. We're all making birdhouses all day long. Um, at the end of the day, or maybe throughout the day, there's probably some maintenance people who come through and sweep the floor, clean up the trash, make sure all of our power tools are working correctly. All of those people are still part of the manufacturing cost, but you can't trace their salaries to any one birdhouse. Does that make sense? Instead, what we have to do is we have to kind of add up all of their, the cost of all of theirs, and then take the number of birdhouses we produced, divide all their costs by that, and that gives us a, a indirect cost per birdhouse. Does that make sense? Their salaries, or let's say the rent we have to pay on the, on the space where we're creating stuff, or maybe the manager, the, the, or the production manager's salary, all of those are costs of manufacturing, which will eventually flow into our cost of goods sold, as opposed to period costs, such as things like um, the insurance and the you know, the utilities for the management's offices and things like that. So what we're trying to do when we, when we deal with managerial accounting is separate out all of the costs of production. So we might say the electricity for the production center, that's a manager, or, a, or that's a production cost, but the electricity for the salesman's offices, that's not. That's we're going to charge that as a period cost or a regular cost month by month. What's tricky about this is that all of the production costs will flow into cost of goods sold. This is what's different about what we've done in the past. Okay. All right. So I mentioned this already, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. Sometimes we, we split them up into what we call prime costs and conversion costs. By prime cost, we mean direct materials and direct labor, sort of. Conversion costs are the cost to convert the raw materials to finished goods. So some of our direct materials, I mean, all of our direct materials are considered prime costs, the cost of the product. All of our overhead, which was, I said, with all those costs of managers and things that are hard to trace to any one product, those are all conversion, costs of creating the raw, taking the raw materials and converting them into a finished good. And, so, and our direct labor has overlap. Okay? And don't worry about this too much. When we get to it, it will be explained more fully. All right, prepare an income statement and schedule of cost of goods manufactured. So you've all learned how to do cost of goods sold, okay? but, which would be your beginning inventory plus any inventory you added minus your ending inventory tells you how much you sold. We learned that in accounting one. Okay. Uh, but here we have cost of goods manufactured. So income statement. Income statement is the same as any other income statement you've ever learned about in the past, with the exception is how we calculate the cost of goods sold. Because remember, in a merchandiser, all we had to do is, in essence, figure out how much stuff we bought from suppliers and what its cost was, and we knew our cost of goods sold. Well, not the stuff we bought, how much stuff we sold and then take its cost from the supplier. Okay. Everything else is the same. So here's how we calculate cost of goods sold. All right. So we start with our raw materials inventory. Those raw materials flow into the work in process inventory, right? If we take a raw material and we start to work on it, it's now a work in process. We put some labor and some overhead costs into it. So the cost of actually changing it 
And then all those other costs, the cost of paying the guy that sweeps up the floor from the to the cost of the manager to the cost of the lights and so forth in the manufacturing facility. And so raw materials plus any labor and manufacturing overhead we put into it become our work in process. And then that flows to our finished goods when we complete the, the, the inventory and it's, and it's a done thing. Okay. Then that finished goods inventory sits there until we sell the item and then each item has a certain cost that we've calculated all along the way and that becomes the cost of goods sold each time we sell an item. So if we come out, if, if it ends up costing us, um, you know, uh, $50 an item, so when it's sitting there in finished goods, we have $50 of raw materials plus direct labor and overhead put into it. And then we sell 10 of them then our cost of goods sold is 500 if it was 50 a piece. Does that make sense? It's not too hard. It's just new. So you'll see as much as well as you can see it, this is the schedule of cost of goods manufactured. Again, you can look it up in the ebook if you need to exhibit 16-10. We have our beginning work in process inventory. Then we, we add in the direct materials that we used any cost of direct labor, any manufacturing overhead, gives us total manufacturing costs. Then we subtract out our ending work in process inventory, and that gives us our cost of goods manufactured. So what we do is we start with the stuff that's in process. What's the value of that? We add in any materials we've added during this period. We add in any labor we've added, and then we add in any of the overhead costs that we've calculated. That gives us our total manufacturing costs. Okay. Then we subtract out our ending work in process inventory, and the difference between all that is how much we moved on and sold. Okay. So that's the cost of goods manufactured. It won't be, once you do it a few times, it's not too bad. It's, it's kind of like a card game. It's hard to explain it to you in concept, but once you work it out, you're like, okay. And then they just want to show you the, the, the flow of costs. So we have our direct materials used. That goes into the calculation of the cost of goods manufactured, and the cost of goods manufactured goes into the cost of goods sold. Okay. Cost of goods sold is calculated by saving cost of goods manufactured, uh, plus any beginning inventory gives us the cost of goods available to sell, right? What we had plus what we manufactured this period tells us how much we have available to sell. We subtract out our ending inventory and that tells us the cost of goods sold, okay? Again, I, I would probably recommend before you work on the homework, just check out these few pages. You don't have to read the whole chapter, but check out these. They're really good. They show the cost flows. All right. So managers have to make decisions based on the cost of the unit. You would be amazed how many people that I run into when I'm doing consulting for businesses that are selling their product at a price less than their cost to produce because they don't have a good handle on what it costs them to produce. And they're like, I don't understand. We increased sales by 40% this period and we're losing more money. And you're like, well, if you were losing a dollar on each item you sold and you sold a thousand more of them, you lost a thousand more dollars, right? But they don't see it, not because they're stupid, most of these people are really smart, but because they don't have a handle on what it truly costs them. A lot of times people just put the direct materials and direct labor in there, and they don't think to account for what all that overhead costs. Well, where's your utility bill? Oh, I don't really count that because I just include it with my other utilities. Okay, well, it's costing you money in utilities every time you make a product. Right. No, I, honestly, that's exactly what they should be doing. But in order to do that, you have to understand what your costs are. And a lot of people don't. 
No, what I find most small business owners that I've worked with from a consulting standpoint, what they're doing is they're basing their cost on their competitor's cost. They're thinking if he sells these widgets for $5 a piece, I better sell them for four fifty. Instead of saying, hey, maybe I have a product that's superior to his and people will be willing to pay a premium for it if I can convince them that it's worth it. Um, you know, so there's, I always, the first one of the first things I try to get people to do is, is calculate what I call a break-even point per unit. You know, this is how much sales, this is how many units I have to sell at this price in order before I'll even break even and cover all these other costs. Um, so it, it's, it's a good thing, you know, that they're teaching you to say, okay, I need a certain profit level. I mean, there is something to be said for competitive bidding too, right? You say, I want to make 10%, but I'm not going to get the job unless I only make 8%. Then, you, then sometimes you suck it up and you only make 8% uh, to get the job. Uh, but there's other people that will kind of do that and do that to the point where they're, they're losing money or barely making any money on the job. Anyway, so to find cost per unit, that's pretty easy. You just take the number of units you sold, multiply it or divide it by um, the cost of goods sold, and that'll give you a cost per unit. Okay? Or another way of looking at it is number of units sold times unit product cost gives you the cost of goods sold. That's easy enough. Okay, calculate cost per service for a service company, cost per item of merchandising company. Okay, same idea. We need to know like how much it costs us. Again, I bet you could go to the average doctor's office here in town and they have no idea what it costs them each time they see a patient. They see patients, well, you'd like to think they see you as people, but they see you as revenue, okay? Uh, they see you as people too, it depends on the person. But they also need to recognize that every time they see a patient, there's certain costs involved, right? Um, there's the things that are kind of obvious, like uh, they have to go through another set of rubber gloves and a little cover for the thermometer and all those little things. And um, But there's also um, what does, 15 minutes of the doctor's time costs and, and so forth, okay? Um, I noticed our doctor's office, they built this big fancy new building a few years back and they used to kind of visit with you and chat with you a little bit and you'd get to know them and really get to like your doctor and they knew you and your kid and was wanting to know what's wrong with your kid today and since they built that building, they're trying to get you in and out. I think they, they probably upped their quota instead of a doctor seeing 15 patients in a day, they needed them to see 20 or something like that uh, because they needed to generate some revenue to pay for the fancy new building, okay? Uh, so it's a business. Funeral homes, they're businesses. Everything's a business. And so even if they have the best hearts in the world, they've got to make enough to pay their employees and keep the lights on and, and take something home to feed their families, right? That's not cynical. That's just realism. All right. So to calculate our cost per service, you take the total cost divided by the number of services provided. That's going to give you a, a cost per service. I, should, I, I don't like the unit cost per service title. I think it should be called an average cost per service because you know that some cost more, some cost less, um, and we're just, we're just doing that. I had a friend who's a, who was a, an attorney, and he's like, I'm tired. You know, attorneys make their money based on hourly billing, so the, they don't really... If they want to make more money, they just have to put in more hours. And he came to me and he was like, I need to, you know, I, there's other things I want to do besides just be a lawyer all the time. I want to be a dad to my kids and be home sometimes. I need to start finding if there's a way. And what we found was that certain activities he could do, a lot more of the activity could be done by an assistant than other activities. So writing a contract, um, the attorney had to put in a fair amount of time on that. But handling a divorce, the attorney puts in a lot less because mostly it's a boilerplate form. You take the time to sit down with the parties and see if you can work out some agreement. And then once everybody agrees on the disposition of assets and where the kids will go, then an assistant who's making 12 bucks an hour can fill out the form and do all the hard work. And then the attorney just has to review it. And, uh, and so it was really distasteful to him that the way he could make more money while spending less hour was to encourage the divorce side of his business, really try to become, like, become more of a divorce attorney when he hated that part of his business. Um, but that's how business works. Um, what I find is most business owners have a handful of products or services that are their signature product or service, the thing that they love, the thing they started the business for in the first place. 
Uh, and oftentimes, those are the things that they're also not making, that, that they might be losing money on. And it's the side thing that they started along the way um, uh, to, to, because they, they needed to make some money that's making the real money. I, I have an example. I worked with a business owner who made custom knives, beautiful custom knives. And he could sell these knives for, you know, $200 or more, two, three, four hundred dollars $400. Um, so you can imagine that the, there was a fair amount of time and labor that went into them, but he had a, but he could, you know, he loved that they were like each a piece of art. Each one was completely custom made to for somebody, and he would often do them for gifts. But you can imagine that the market for $400 knives is a slimmer market than the market for a $40 knife. So he was when he was trying to make ends meet early in the he he would go to these like hunting shows and stuff, and he would get orders to make these custom knives. But a lot of people would say, "Do you have anything like semi-custom that's?" That's a lot cheaper, you know, that you could, you know, that you kind of mass produce almost, and and it would just be, you know, we could choose between the the wood that goes in the handle or a couple of other options. So he started offering the semi-custom knife for like a fourth of the price of the custom knife, and that became his volume product, and that became where he was making money. But he found it kind of soul sucking because he was an artist, and for him it was almost like selling out. To make something that was, yeah, not his best, and uh, and so we started doing the math on it, and he would put so many hours into these custom knives that that from a if if we were paying him a fair hourly wage, he was losing money on them, even at four hundred bucks, because uh, he would put because he would throw his whole soul into them. Artists do that <laughs> a lot of times, um, and so you know he 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 reached this point where he was like. Either I consider the semi-custom knives as like a, a necessary evil to allow me to keep doing my art. It supports the art side, or I just kind of I'm just going to quit the whole thing because it's not worth it to me to have this sucking my soul so I can do this every once in a while. And he ended up just not doing it anymore. So, um, but it took him coming to this point where he realized this hobby of his had just become a job. You know, so it was started with something he loved. He started making some money with it. And then it became a job, uh, and he started hating it. Uh, that's business. Uh, <laughs> is that negative? That's, uh, that's life sometimes. Um, unit cost per item in a manufacturing situation, total cost of goods sold by the, divided by the total number of items sold gives us unit cost. So that's not crazy hard math. It's pretty logical and pretty obvious, actually. Um, for, for guys like that, there's also the other guy who who finds that he really does love it and he feels like he's making a difference in the world through his business. So, you know, it's, it's okay. 